Welcome to the Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm your host, Sam Gill. A central topic on this program has been not simply the role of technology in our democracy, but the unique cultural moment we seem to be in regarding how we feel about technology. At a time in which we are relying on digital technology and especially social media more than ever, and when a handful of technology companies are driving ever increasing returns in public markets, we are also coming face to face with the potential challenges that technology poses uniquely to democratic society. Many of these challenges have to do with what sort of in the parlance of the day is called content, the things we say, post, express, upload for others to see. So much of our contemporary anxiety about the role of technology in our democracy has to do with content we don't like, hateful content, misleading content, erroneous content, polarizing content. It seems as if the future of the internet turns on the idea of content, what it is, what makes it good or bad, and how we can manage it. Olivier Sylvain is at the leading edge of these debates. A legal scholar, he has been a persistent and thoughtful critic of an approach to, the te to technology and the internet that abdicates responsibility for the consequences of so much content and how it's managed. It's my absolute delight to welcome to the program, Olivier Sylvain. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I think you're still on mute. There we yeah, go. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Sam. Great pleasure to be here. So I just to help our audience get up to speed, I'd, I'd like to start with um, just hearing from you about the sort of legal, the regulatory and legal apparatus that shapes where we are. Um, it's sort of, it's a moment where everyone's learning about what section 230 is and 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 what exactly um governs or doesn't govern content moderation so can you tell us a little bit about what you know what are the rules or not that are governing the space and what were some of the key ideas animating those rules when they were first formulated uh um sure i'm happy to uh answer that and and you know i, I don't want to sound like a you know a stereotypical uh, academic, but I feel like the, an the answer to that question is a long one. Before I, before I get to that, though, I, I want to thank you, uh, Sam and, and John Sands and everybody at night uh, for uh, supporting my work. I'm, I'm grateful, uh, greatly gr uh, grateful for it. Um, so, so what is the regulatory apparatus that sets up where we are today? I think it actually doesn't start with what I think you suggest, and that is Section 230 in 1996 when Congress amends the, telecom, the, the Communications Act or the Telecom Act. I think to help think about the current problems today, we, we do have the First Amendment as a kind of backdrop. And, and that's why I say this, it's a longer answer, um, only because there are a long line of cases involving, and you know, and, and Knight knows these cases well, um, involving the prerogative that newspapers have to make decisions about what kinds of content in their op-ed pages and in their news stores allowed to produce. So, so I, I think that there's a ground level constitutional interest that does suggest that, that that's set up by the courts, one case involving the Miami Herald uh, uh, particular, is set up by the courts that says that, that, that publishers of a certain kind, most of them have the prerogative to make decisions about what kind of content appears on the pages, even if it originates or the author for of it is from somewhere else. Section 230, 47 USC 230, is um, uh, what you, uh, I think you want me to, to, to jump into, and I'm, that's, that, let's talk about it. And you should cut me off, by the way, if you feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not doing justice to the question. Um, but but with, with Section 230 in 1996, with the, at, the, at the, the commercial birth of the internet, right? When after it's becomes the, the, the Congress effectively commercializes the public internet in 1995, Congress decides that, that it has to take care about, it has to tend to the content that's appearing. And a lot of that stuff they're really worried about is pornography, right? And their kids access to pornography. So section 230 is, is part of a reform associated with the Communications Decency Act. Uh, and section 223, which 
precedes 230 in the US code is addressed to making sure that um, there were mechanisms and safe harbors for intermediaries that were trafficking in uh, pornography and, and obscenity. Uh, those provisions get struck down in the case ACLU v. Reno in 1997. What survives is what governs stuff today, right? Section 230. And Congress in Section 230 sought to create an incentive for platforms. I use the term platforms loosely. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk more about this. Um, but for online intermediaries to attend to the content that users are posting, but without doing it through positive or affirmative government regulation, right, to promote self-regulation. And the way to do that is to create an, an immunity, a safe harbor. Uh, and, and, and I read 230C12 as the mechanism for the safe harbor. If you take voluntary steps in good faith to take down bad stuff, you get the immunity. The courts, however, didn't, do not agree with my common sense reading the statute. 1997, the Fourth Circuit in the case involving AOL said that this is actually um, a more a broader protection. Uh, and Section 230C1 immunizes online intermediaries as publishers or distributors. And the argument that Congress sought to put forward and that the Fourth Circuit ratifies is that these entities that have emerged, like you, at the time, you might think of AOL, the Craigslist, a little bit later, are trafficking in so much content to, require, to impose liability on them for anything that users post would create um, a disincentive for innovation and would stifle speech online. So the intermediaries are, ought, to be free, um, to be un, ought to be unfettered in the language of the statute to allow all kinds of content and not be beholden for the bad stuff that users post. And so, you know, there's, a, there's concepts happening in that debate uh, both in the in, in the judicial context and the original statutory context, that we haven't we haven't lost even as the internet's evolved, right? Innovation being a critical priority and opportunity of the internet, that the internet allows innovation at a pace at a scale that's different. Um, an idea that that the that the beauty of the internet is the content, is the stuff that we can that we can produce so much stuff and share it with each other. And you've, you've talked about, um, I think in an essay you contributed to us, that there's a kind of romanticism about some of the ideas that maybe that we have continued to traffic in about what the internet is. Could you, could you talk about that? Why is this a romantic kind of sensibility? Well, so I do think there's a romanticism about content and the proliferation of all kinds of content, right? And lurking under there is a, is a, is a normative faith that precedes the internet. And that is that in the open free market of discourse, right? There's a kind of a marketplace of discourse that the best ideas will prevail. Um, and, and the best relief for um, harmful content is responsive content, right? So mo that, that more speech is, is better than, than less speech. So I think there is a fetishization of that for sure. I associate this with a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a small L um, liberal conception of what a communications or speech market looks like. I, I actually don't all, I don't just think it's about the fetishization of content for its own sake. It's also a fetishization of innovation and, you know, and this kind of fascination with upstarts and emerging companies coming out of Northern California to change the world, to shake things up and, 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 re, and, and democratize our, our markets and, and, and democracy and, and, and political system. Um, and, and I'm very cynical about that. I, I, I think that those are rhetorical tools that actually mask uh, what is the, the power dynamics that, and the structural dynamics that actually precede um, and lurk under uh, the rhetoric. Say more about that. Well, so, so um, I mean, so everyone wants to be the next innovative startup, not everyone, but you know, a lot of the startups coming out of Northern California for the past two and a half decades, um, they, you know, they all want to be the next Craigslist, the next Facebook. And, and there's, and, and, and I'm not, I don't want to be the one to shut down that vibe. Um, but, but on the other hand, um, that, that um, eagerness, that energy is uh, inattentive, in, insufficiently attentive to a whole set of problems and consequences of the, the things that they create um, and the costs that they engender for communities that have always been um, overlooked. Uh, it kind of entrenches power 
uh, in, under the guise of, of this kind of happy story about innovation. I know that's a kind of abstract way of putting it. I mean, I've written about, about um, intermediaries that purport to be sharing, you know, enabling the distribution of information, but in the, as in the process have made life far more difficult for historically disadvantaged groups. Yeah, let's talk, I mean, let's talk more about that because that really is, that is the, the ethos, right? The ethos is somehow that technology will liberate us, you know, the techno that, that, that the uh, pro problems of discrimination, of differential access to opportunity, you know, these are problems of the analog world. And it's the, that, the, that the, the combination of technology and the engineering mind, the neutrality of the engineering mind, Will, is, will truly allow us to escape this. And th that hasn't been abandoned. I mean, the, in fact, COVID, you, you see more of the, of, the, of, the, of the high priests of Silicon Valley talking about just doing away with institutions and building new institutions. So, you know, the whole problem is the rubble of the, past, the preceding two millennia, and we can clear it away with technology. But it seems we're, we're also now coming face to face with more vivid examples of what you're talking about, of the way in which we have imported, in some cases accelerated, just moved over um, all of the same disparities that we had before. Where, where are some of the places where you, where we're starting to see attention to this that you think will be promising? Um, so, so great. I mean, in the COVID world, in, 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 now that we're all kind of where we are in the context of COVID, I think of Zoom a little bit. I, I'm, I'm going to talk more substantively about, about um, uh, what I've written about in the context of targeted advertising and dis mm -hmm. discrimination, but, but um, when when I mean Zoom is, is is a remarkable platform, right? And we're we're using it here. I use it for my classes. Um, but early on, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a service that thought of itself as um, as as consumer oriented, right? And 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 they had to shift. It was a, it was an enterprise line of business, so they didn't tend to things like privacy, right? Um, they didn't attempt to things like Zoom bombing. Um, you don't have to really worry about that when you're doing a conference with your colleagues and over a meeting, right? Um, and, and the only reason I mention that is because there are a whole set of public law priorities and norms that we do generally attend to, but that in pursuit of this business model, um, this company was um, just um, neg neg neglectful of. With regards to the things that people are now thinking about, uh, you know, and the disparities that it, that um, current application services entrench. The uh, I, I've talked a lot about uh, Facebook's um, ad manager and the ways in which people can use proxies for race, what what Facebook calls a multicultural affinity groups in advertising um, in markets where it's unlawful to do it, right? Um, and what we've seen in our circumstance, or, or, or a set of cases that, that um, settled ultimately in, in March 2019, that Facebook settled, by the way, and in recognition that they were enabling discrimination in ways that ways are arguably more pernicious than they were before. Um, and just a couple, just last week, Facebook, uh, even in spite of the settlement and the way that we, in which they would restructure their ad manager, is only last week, um, pursuant to a lot of research that that a Politico and the markup have done as journalists um, that Facebook decided they would not allow any proxies for race, right? They, they would not allow the use of multicultural affinity groups on the ad manager because it does entrench discrimination um, across markets, not just in housing and, and education. So what, you know, one of the thing, one of the shifts we have seen during a, during a time of COVID is is it's it's not clear to me that that the that some of the platform, particularly social media companies, are, are yet willing to to publicly espouse a, you know a standard of responsibility for content, but they have been taking new steps. You know we've seen some some new steps taken around health information, including statements about representations about health made by public officials, which is a place that for a long time the companies really would not go. And we've also seen some steps uh, taken around election related information, including with regard to the president of the United States. Um, but we see, but even in that moment, we've seen the same hesitation around statements made by public officials that could be considered um, you know, racial incitements, for example. And, you know, it, to what extent is this is this difference in treatment um, reflect a, a, a materially challenging decision about 
how to intervene in content online and to what extent is this exactly what you're talking about, which is that when the implied victim is everybody and therefore kind of a homogenous idea of a white person, we can take down the health misinfo. But when, when the implied victim is a, is a, is a, represents a marginalized community, it's just, we don't seem to be willing to go there. We don't seem to be willing to take a stance that would be accused of being non-neutral, even if it is perhaps more just. What, what do you think is going on? Well, Sam, the easy answer to that question is racism. Um, but uh, I think we can unpack this some more. Um, so your, your question, I don't want to be too glib about it, right? But the question of why is it that attention to harm to historically marginalized groups is not as um, urgent as a generalized sure. harm. Racism is the reason for that. Um, or gender bias is the reason for it. Um, and and how, you know, how do we get at that? Great question. I think that a lot of young people are wrestling with this far more closely than many of us have um, this, this, this past summer. Um, uh, how else um, can we unpack this? Um, I, 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 I very much appreciate the question because it, it kind of, it helps us think about the role that the language we use to talk about the law and policy in this area is enabling of um, mechanisms of, of oppression, right? Um, so um, it, it would be great if intermediaries were as a matter of course, while developing a design for an application were attentive to the potential harms uh, of any automated decision-making system or any, any service on historically disadvantaged groups. We do something similar in the environmental law setting, right? We require environmental impact statements. Andrew Selbst, who is at UCLA and AI Now, based out of New York, led by Kate Crawford, Merrick Whitaker, have argued for something like algorithmic um, impact statements, similar sort of thing, where, we, where in the first instance, before you deploy something and put it on the market, you evaluate what its impact is on certain historically disadvantaged groups. So I think that would get us closer. Uh, and I do think we're in 2020, we're as close to that as we've ever been. Um, uh, but it, you know, my glib answer to your question is racism is the reason for that. And if we want to redress racism, we need tools that are explicit about its existence. Do you, I mean, let's, so let's imagine though, that we, we, we started to push toward um, a regime like that so that we there was a sort of a, an examination before the fact or in some it, it, before the fact of wide adoption um, and we included in it these sorts of criteria you know that, it, that, that we, we we really determined specified kinds of social harm um, some of which would be the kind of harm around health misinformation sort of you know vital vital uh, life issues and some of it might might be some articulation, however imperfect, around discrimination. Things that we see, uh, for example, in, in in housing law. The it strikes me the the rejoinder, and this is an issue I struggle with. The thing about the companies, the rejoinder is always a management rejoinder. It's that the scale of the network, the speed and scale of the network, which itself is generative of the conduct, um, right. Right. is too vast. I mean, I my joke is always that the 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 when the when the companies testify. In Congress, they always open their statements the same way. They say something like, you know, as a company, uh, you know, as a platform that has 1 billion new videos per nanosecond, we are always at the forefront of new challenges when it comes to providing, you know, a safe, enjoyable environment. And so what do, is, are, are the systems just too big and fast? I mean, is it, is it, are they just endemically difficult to manage in the way that an industrial manufacturer can, at great expense, undertake an environmental impact assessment? So good. Um, I mean, it is their choice to be that big. This is, this is your, your point. Um, and it is their choice to be that fast. Uh, and they have every incentive to do it. Um, and, and I mean, there are, I'm not an economist, but I just assume that there are a whole set of um, um, reasons why a company want to internalize a lot of, or want to externalize a lot of costs and not internalize them. And then making, getting bigger is just part of what that entails um, in some ways. I, I agree. Um, so I don't know if you're suggesting that one fix would be to attend to how big these companies are, or whether this is about attending to how fast they're getting content out. I, don't, I actually, I mean, part of me just wants to stay clear of that because, um, I mean, I do think that there's, there are advantages for us to be able to do this Zoom stuff um, as though we're contemporaneously speaking to each other in real time. I mean, that's, that's I, and speed, so I'm not allergic to the possibility of speed. 
But are there mechanisms, and I'm not a technologist, right, but far from it, but are there mechanisms that um, keep these companies in check? So Facebook just today um, announced that they will, um, in the week before the election, will be will will develop um, automated decision making systems that attend to the kinds of content that get distributed. They clearly, in spite of the massive amounts of content, Sam, they clearly have the capacity to do this kind of self regulation. And and they and they chosen not to until now, right? Um, it, it was kind of this. Facebook has done a lot of hand wringing about it. Um, so there there are technological mechanisms that get them there. But the argument I've made is that we have already tools that that would create an incentive, and it's called law. Section 230, and you know, I, I, often people want to stay clear of the 230 debate because it is it is a it is an explosive one. But the immunity under Section 230 basically um, absolves. It's a pretty broad immunity. It absolves Facebook from the costs associated with making decisions about this, and and the social costs. And so they've never really had a, a the incentive. Every other company every other business has in this country, the incentive of getting prosecuted or getting sued for the ways in which they enable bad conduct. Um, so I think we, I think one possibility is to just, is to unleash, um, unleash law um, in this setting. How, what are some alternative formulations that you've argued for that you think regulators should, should consider uh, around, around, around this particular issue? Well, um, I mean, there are a lot of, there are different proposals out there. Daniel Citron, who I know you know, um, and many people do, she's a leader in this area, uh, along with uh, Marianne Franks and Ben Wittes uh, in different papers, have argued for um, a, a kind of reasonableness standard where you evaluate whether or not an entity is entitled to an immunity if they take reasonable steps in good faith to take stuff down, right? Um, it's actually what the statute, the Section 230 says, but, but uh, you know, they, they would, that's how you would think about it. And so Facebook is actually in earnest and taking reasonable steps to take harmful, dangerous, law, unlawful content down, they might be entitled to immunity. In some ways, I, I'm, I'm on board with that. Another way is, um, is, is that we, you can continue to amend the statute so that um, whenever a public law addressed to the protection of historically disadvantaged groups, say in voting or, or elections or housing or education, that any public law that is alleged in a complaint um, would is, is not is an, any allegation under such a law would not entitle an immunity an immunity uh, an, an intermediary to an immunity. That's one possibility. The PACT Act, which is something I testified about in Congress over the summer, and that there's this the Senate version of a reform um, uh, coming from um, Senator Schatz um, it, and and Senator Thune, a bipartisan effort would actually uh, assert that we can go further, that any civil enforcement of federal law uh, and other things would not entitle the company to immunity. That is any allegation of a violation of federal law would not entitle an, a, an entity to an immunity. And, that's be, and, and if that enforcement action were brought by a governmental agency. And I think that gets closer to vindicating core public law priorities that historically in the past 25 years interactive computer services, online intermediaries have not been subject to. Are there other doctrines in the, in the law? Spencer Overton and I have talked a bit about applying just longstanding civil rights doctrines um, to, to, to certain kinds of content. Are there other doctrines in the law that we should be recovering for the purpose of, of the, because part of my takeaway from what you're saying is, let's not be beguiled by quite how different the internet is. It's different in some important ways, and it's just not different in some pretty important ways. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I like to think tort law and uh, disparate impact standards under um, statutory law um, are, are effective. I, I, you know, Spencer's work on, on voting uh, and the ways in which um, platforms, online intermediaries um, perpetuate um, um, election arms, uh, you know, is, is useful for thinking about this because there are remedies, you know, if, if you target a community in particular and, and give them disinformation about an election, um, that is the sort of thing that public law creates a remedy for. So I agree, I mean, there are longstanding um, principles that are in law that we might re need to, we, we might resuscitate. For me, it doesn't take a lot of imagination though um, on this. It, it's really just about lifting aspects of the immunity. You know, it's, it, it's, 
this, this law exists with regards to every other company. It's not old stuff. This is live real law. We just don't ever apply it to online intermediaries who act as the least cost avoider, um, you know, to invoke the uh, law school term, um, the, the, the entities most capable of protecting against harm are the ones that are somehow uh, immune from um, being held to account. So if we looked at immunity, all those traditional mechanisms, which are in place today with regards to every other company would be available. And what about, how, what do you make of, of, of efforts by other countries to address this issue? EU countries have taken different approaches than the, than the U.S. Do you have a view on the efficacy of some of those approaches? I don't. One of the questions we're getting. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And um, I, I unfortunately don't feel expert enough to kind of opine on that. Uh, I mean, I know the general ethos in Europe is to be, pretty, is to be more skeptical uh, about intermediaries. Uh, uh, but they do have something like something similar to Section 230 in in Europe. Is, uh, um, uh, so so I don't I don't want to I don't want to say I, it's I kind of outside of my wheels. I don't want to opine on. I have some views on it, but I, I I don't think they'll be. I don't think I'll get move the ball forward on that. Um, the one thing I've I mean one thing I do encounter when I give to, in spite of what I just said I do get invited to give talks in Europe um, and. And, and one of the points that people in Europe make um, about, uh, you, about the US law is that, is that these, these are platforms that are based here, headquartered here. And so the ethos, um, the, the term you use, which I think is very useful, that, that kind of powers the political economy and law in this area has an outsized influence uh, around the world. And so uh, Europe has an approach. Brazil has actually um, been very creative in thinking about the enforcement of, of civil rights norms um, on network platforms. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of people are waiting to hear what the U.S. will do in the coming year or two. And I do think reform is, is coming. I, I, do, I look. I think that's substantively true. I mean, I think it's substantively true that the fact that they're based here and reflect uh, a very sort of American sensibility, as you outlined at the very beginning about the some, some ideas of expression, the philosophy of expression is true. I do think that like uh, they're, they're, uh, I do find that, that, that the, the, the global argument is shifts according to what's convenient. I mean, I think you hear some of these platforms say, well, well we wouldn't want to adopt a Chinese standard of speech so that, that's why we need to, to operate this way. But then when it's convenient, they'll say it's actually really hard to have standards that work for every country. And so we need to, you know, we need to tailor sometimes in order to have the, in order to be able to operate a number of different countries. Like I, I, I you know, I, there, there's like, a, there's a couple of places where there's a lot of equivocation that I think, um, that, it, that, that I think uh, contributes to sort of deliberate, um, deliberate confusion in this debate. I think that's one, I think the point you've made that, to, to, to sort of assume that, that we haven't imported, that we haven't brought over all kinds of forms of differential treatment and discrimination is another. I think the way in which the, the, the content moderation costs are externalized to other countries physically, you know, and the people that actually is sort of another one. There are a lot of places where I think, um, where I think the, the, con the confusion we, we find ourselves in is our own in some ways. I think you're generous to call it a confusion, Sam. Um, <laughs> I actually think it's a deliberate way of mobilizing a, an interest in protecting the prerogatives of powerful intermediaries. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't wanna overstate that. I mean, I, I, I think I could be more careful about that, but, but I, 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 at a minimum, it's a confusion, right? And, um, and I think the, the, those the three ways of thinking about it are, are exactly right, I, but I, I do think that this, this is, it's of a piece with a general, uh, general and colorable concern about governmental, localized government and any governmental regulation of information flows. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a healthy skepticism, right? Um, the, so, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm going a little off topic on this, but I do wanna make the observation that even in the United States where we have a robust free speech doctrine um, there are categories of speech and there are categories of people who are the targets of speech who are, who are for which there's law. Um, and, and that's so that not all content, and you started this way, kind of got fetish of speech and content. Not all content is protected. Um, all kinds of communicative acts are, are deemed dangerous. Uh, and, and I think we can, 
allow that countries around the world can exert their sovereign authority to do that. Um, um, uh, I mean, I, there are limits to how far they should be able to go, but, but um, anyway, so that's neither here nor yeah. there for a general reaction to what you said. Yeah, I think what I, I think that that clearly that, that seems to be a part of the, one of the things I was going to ask you about is, you know, you've made the point early in this conversation that there are really the steps that we can take are not they're not hard to imagine. I think you said, you know, they're practical. We can we've articulated them. We're not searching for a new legal theory. We've got legal. We've got theories in law. We've got theories of conduct. Um, we've got theories of business management. I mean, I think environmental impact assessments are as much a theory of law as they are a theory of business management um, that we can be that we can be applying to this. But it, I guess it strikes me that we we when when we get stuck on um, th these ways of articulating a philosophy of expression, ways of articulating a culture of expression, and so what do if we if we you know I'm asking you more of a political question in a way than a legal question, but what do you what do you think we need to do to kind of get past um, these, these, these sort of high-minded arguments that make it very difficult to talk about um, reasonable control over, over content and expression? To talk about specific harms, talk about real harms. And, and I very much appreciate the observation you made, which I was, you know, I had a glib answer to, um, you know, uh, well, and just let me return to it. So, so we have to tell the story about how people are harmed. You made the observation that you know these days uh, the only way people recognize harm is if there's a kind of generalized abstract white person that is a subject of a harm. Um, I think you're right about that, um, uh, and I, I'm I'm okay with keep telling the stories if if this you know to be completely strategic about it. Keep telling the story about people getting harmed, whether they're white or black. Um, and because that's where we are. I mean, this, this immunity is not, it, it perpetuates and entrenches structural disparities, but this is an immunity that exposes all of us, right? The current governing logic exposes all of us to harms that would otherwise not be um, happening. So I'll keep telling the stories. But more than that, I, I do think that we're at a special moment in 2020 when we can talk about the ways in which rhetorical forms, legal forms perpetuate entrenched disparities, right? Um, where the discourse of neutrality is actually a discourse of oppression, when you don't recognize histories of oppression and disparity. Um, so, but I don't think we need, I actually, you know, I don't strategically, I don't think we need to go that far. I think that we have enough stories of, of young uh, white women who are harmed because of an immunity um, of, uh, and maybe we need just need to, to be frank. Maybe these more stories of um, white men be getting harmed uh, as a result of the immunity, um, which and there there are those as well. Um, the story out of the um, the Grinder case out of New York, Eric the Grinder case. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I I don't know how far we can go on this. You asked me this question not as a legal question, but as a kind of strategic question, and I can be cynical about it. And we just need to tell stories about people that are more that look more like most people in America, or we can just keep telling stories about harm and injury. And in, year, in, in 2020, I think we have an opening to talk about entrenched um, power disparities and, and racial subordination. I th you know, one of the things I like about um, the idea of environmental Im impact assessments um, is that I, I, it, there, there is something to those as storytelling devices. There now there mm. it's a rehearsal of harm on the terms of the company, but there are, you know, for most of these, you know, I mean, a lot of people who are listening to this have seen these kinds of things. There's there are technical standards for what you have to report. So there's only so much you can fudge. There's kind of a common language to what we're talking about happening. Mm. Um, it creates the opportunity for discussion. I think I used to do a lot of work in voting rights around the time that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was invalidated by the Supreme Court, which is the pre is the is the provision that for certain districts, as you know, but sort of for our audience, that certain districts with really his, historically disparate rates of voter registration by race had to get permission if they wanted to change election laws. And it always struck me that obviously a, a part of this sort of encroachment in state sovereignty was to protect people because the losing the right to vote is impossible to regain in a given election. But it also had the advantage of the storytelling. You know, it was documenting the way in which acts of oppression were being enacted and in some cases 
resisted. And, I, and, and, in, and the kind of clinical dispassion was actually an aid. It allowed us to sort of bureaucratize our response to that, to that, kind, of, uh, that kind of oppression. So I don't, you know, I wonder, maybe, maybe part of the moment of 2020 is that, um, is that we, we have these opportunities to say, you know, you need to be issuing racial impact statements. You need to have a civil rights audit every two years. You need to do these things that don't strike us as storytelling, but are really the elevation of and the documentation of, um, you know, vulnerability and opportunity for harm. I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way, but that's certainly how I react to your idea. I, I very much like it. And I like the point, and it's consistent with people who've made arguments about um, the importance of narrative in law. Um, and I, I, do th I don't know enough about the scholarship involving environmental impact statements, although I did refer to them, um, to know what the alignment is with this account of narrative. But story, it is about storytelling and it in some ways means to destabilize or reorient the way we think about um, the, what companies do. I, but I, I, am, I, I mentioned it, but I, I have to say I'm also a little skeptical about their relative impact. I mean, they're kind of check the box sorts of um, um, so an algorithmic impact statement or an, an environmental impact statement, one impact statements that address the disparate impact of any automated decision making system or a social media application would be would be good for the accounting of the thing. But then what? Right. But then what? And and, uh, I, you know, I tend to think good old fashioned liability rules are are uh, are as strong and useful a mechanism for putting people in line as simple storytelling, right? I mean, listen, I, I love a good story and I think stories when that haven't been told um, should be told, uh, right? So, uh, um, but, but, but I, 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 think, I think we need more than that. Uh, and another regulatory regime, just to get at this, um, is, is preclearance. Um, uh, so you, you mentioned the Voting Rights Act. Um, we have a variety of um, public laws that are addressed to um, pre-approval that require government agency approval of some deployment of a system. Voting is one of them. The FDA operates another one, yep. right? Um, and Andrew Tutt wrote this piece three years ago. I'm fascinated by it. My current project is focused on. Uh, in the context of drugs and devices, the FDA, for certain kinds of class three devices, has to pre-clear before, before market de deployment. Not for all, right? So, so there are some categories of a product that are dangerous enough and you suggested it actually in the way that you were describing things. So there's certain things in public law that we worry so much about. Maybe it's racial discrimination, maybe it's consumer fraud, you know, maybe it's healthcare related information, maybe it's election information, but there's certain kinds of information we worry so much about that, that we should have an accounting before the deployment, before the harm is under, uh, happens. And so, so an algorithmic impact statement or environmental impact statement would be good, but I think we could do more, right? We can, we can invoke the power of a public interest agent, a public interested agency to attend to this. Yeah, I think, I mean, another regulatory regime that comes to mind sort of in thinking of your both and approach is, you know, auto safety, which, you know, it's kind of, kind of birth of a lot of public interest laws around this period, but you've got, you know, you have huge issue with auto deaths, 30s, 40s, 50s, and it's because the things we like about cars are the things that make them dangerous. If a car is bigger and faster, it, you are more likely to to be to be in a in a fatal accident uh, the the accident you're in is more likely to be a fatal one and it seems to me we've we've combined on the front end that you have to that there are check the box exercises there's a common language about what the harm is you've got to you have to have the safety engineers working at your company they're empowered to do that but then also when the GM ignition system didn't work you you know Mary Barra still had to come in front of Congress, and there st still were legal doctrines for remediation. I, that was a great example, I think, where the the check the box system was covering up other ways in which engineering uh, decisions were enabling harm. And so, I, it strikes me part of the problem on the internet is that you we still don't have that clarity about the harm. We still don't have enough clarity to haul the person in. You see that in the hearings with the with the with the CEOs. I thought members of Congress were much more sophisticated this summer with technology CEOs, than, certainly than the Mark Zuckerberg hearing, but there's not a moral clarity, it seems to me yet, about what the, what the harm is and whether that's sort of willful or, or to be developed, I don't know. So I'm curious about this point, um, Sam, that you make. So, I, I mean, for me, there's a lot of moral clarity and I think there's a lot of moral clarity for you. And I think, I actually think for, I think a lot of people who recognize that these intermediaries occupy a, a privileged place in the ways in which we, in, 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 in society, so I, I, I actually do think that there's a kind of 
normative interest that people are channeling. And maybe the confusion is in how to articulate it. That confusion, I think, is born from a strategy that means to confuse us, uh, um, that, that fetishizes content, that fetishizes innovation. Um, and, and, but, but, but the tools are, everything is, is it's right, right before us. We, we see how powerful these companies are. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, I guess I, I, wanna, I wanna agree with you, but I wanna say that maybe we can be far more aggressive in thinking about regulatory intervention in spite of what we is presented as confusing. So la just last question, because we gotta let you go. Are you, are you uh, an optimist? On, on, on this topic or a pessimist and, and why are you, whatever your affect is? <laughs> um, I tend to be an optimist about things and, I, and um, about things generally. Uh, and so I don't know if that's gonna be helpful, but, but uh, I do think, I'm, I sense that people want some change. They do envision, when I say people, I think most, most Americans are attentive to the possibility of changes coming with regards to what intermediaries must do. Even Facebook recognizes it. When, when Mark Zuckerberg a year and a half ago, or was it two years ago, said that we, you know, tell us how to be regulated. We want to regulate. Please regulate us. I think it's an admission that, that something is happening. So I'm, I'm hopeful. The, the, the challenging part is, are we going to end up in a place that is productive? I worry about stifling speech. I don't, I think that, I, I know Knight worries about stifling speech. Um, uh, but are so, so I, I mean, I, I do worry about that, but we, we are not even close to that place yet, right? So I'm hopeful that some change um, uh, happens uh, and, and I, I just, I worry to the extent there's worry that we, we get it right. Fair enough. Well, this debate is not going away anytime soon. Uh, you can follow Olivier on Twitter at Olivier Sylvain. And as always, we'll send that out to you after the show with some of his writing. Uh, Olivier, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Sam. I very much appreciate it. All right, folks, before we go, just a quick note on some of our upcoming shows. On September 10th, next week, we'll have Nicole Austin Hillary from Human Rights Watch to talk about civil rights in voting in election 2020. On September 17th, we'll welcome Professor Kathy Cohen from the University of Chicago to talk about race in America. And on September 24th, we'll have Alondra Nelson, president of the Social Science Research Council. As a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash fdshow. You can also subscribe to the Future of Democracy podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Email us at fdshow at kf.org. Or if you have questions for me, just send me a note on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Please stay as always for 30 seconds to take a two question survey. And we will end the show to the sounds of Miami songwriter, Nick County. You can always find his music on Spotify. Until next week, thanks for joining us and stay safe.